Chapter 29, the very last chapter of Making America, Entering a New Century, 1992 to the Present. Individual Choices, Evan Williams. For Evan Williams, the choices were not difficult. He just allowed himself to follow his interests. That included leaving the University of Nebraska in his sophomore year when he concluded that college was not for him. He took jobs in Florida and Texas, becoming aware of his interests and opportunities in the emerging field of computer technology connected to the internet. In 1994, he returned to Nebraska and, with his father, formed a company that produced CD-ROMs and videos instructing people how to use the internet. The company failed. Later, he admitted that he had no idea of or interest in running a company and that he was more interested in starting new projects than finishing old ones. Leaving angry employees behind, Williams moved to Northern California where he worked for various computer-related industries, mostly in areas associated with web development. Wanting to work on his own schedule and pursue his ideas, in 1999, he and Meg Houghton formed Praya Labs, which produced various marketing programs. Williams and his groups tinkered with the process and developed a new application for general use on the internet. He named the program The Blogger. It allowed people to create their own websites without knowing how to program. The blog allowed unlimited communications through the internet with anyone wanting to log onto the site. Its use exploded, creating new forms of publishing and journalism. Some used it to keep not-so-personal diaries and journals, while others created specialized newsletters and information and opinion pieces. Many fully embraced the new technology and see the internet, blogs, and texting as a positive, even liberating means of communication. But others, as shown in this chapter's Individual Voices feature, offer a different vision. In 2003, with blogging reaching millions, Williams sold the company to Google, making him and his partners rich. They went on to work for the corporate giant, but Williams found that the corporate climate at Google stifled his curiosity and creativeness. After two years, he left Google, saying that he needed freedom to scratch new itches. One itch produced a new company, Obvious, and a brainstorming session brought a new variation of the blog, a mini-blog called Twitter. Although it limits text to only 140 characters and was designed to answer questions like, what are you doing now, Twitter uses have expanded its function, changing the nature of social networking and modern communications. By the spring of 2009, well over 15 million people were Twittering, tweeting, or sending tweets. Most carried personal messages, but Twitter also emerged as an immediate source of information. For example, during protests in Iran over disputed elections, protesters used Twitter to communicate to the world when the government blocked other modes of communication. We think of Twitter, Williams explained, not as a social network, but an information network. In implementing his domestic agenda, President Bill Clinton, elected of course in 92, balanced between social activism and fiscal conservatism. By 1994, his policies and personal behavior had led to a series of Republican congressional victories, political gridlock, and a partisan effort to impeach him. Clinton survived the Republican efforts and by 2000 had balanced the budget as the economy soared. The year 2000 saw no lessening of divisions in the nation as Republican George W. Bush narrowly defeated Al Gore in an election decided by the Supreme Court. Bush's efforts to implement his domestic policy, however, were overwhelmed on September 11, 2001 when terrorists crashed airliners into New York's World Trade Center and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. The nation immediately united behind Bush, who declared a global war on terrorism that focused on Afghanistan and Iraq. Both appeared to be easy victories as the Taliban regime collapsed in Afghanistan and Saddam Hussein fled Baghdad. Replacing the two regimes with stable and democratic governments, however, proved more difficult. By the time of Bush's re-election, the Taliban was conducting a guerrilla war against the Afghan government and Iraq was mired in a civil war. As the violence in Iraq heightened, an increasing number of people questioned the American presence there. In 2006, opposition to the war contributed to Democrats gaining control of Congress. The 2008 Democratic presidential primaries made political history with a woman and an African American emerging as the leading candidates for the nomination. Barack Obama, of course, secured the nomination and faced off against Senator John McCain. As the candidates debated policy on Iraq and Obama's political experience, an economic crisis shifted political priorities and contributed to an Obama victory. McCain, by the way, was of course running as a Republican and Obama ran as a Democrat. Faced with two wars and an economic emergency, President Obama hoped for bipartisan support but found increasingly partisan opposition. Though Republicans vowed to oppose his domestic and foreign agendas, Obama successfully pushed through legislation to stimulate the economy and implement a national health care system. Neither program found much support among voters who, energized by the newly formed Tea Party movement, in 2010 elected a majority of Republicans to the House of Representatives. The result was political gridlock and a budget crisis that threatened the slowly recovering economy. In foreign policy, Obama oversaw the withdrawal of American forces from Iraq and increased the military effort in Afghanistan. In 2012, Republicans selected Mitt Romney to run against Obama. Romney promised to repeal Obama's health care package, restore conservative values, and use his business expertise to improve the economy. Democrats argued that Romney represented the wealthy and that his policies would harm the majority of Americans socially and economically. 
With women, African-American, and Latino voters playing key roles, and with large numbers of Democrats turning out to vote, Obama won re-election easily with more than 51% of the popular vote. Obama's victory did not lead to an end of political gridlock, though. Instead, disparities over gun controls, immigration, and government spending furthered an ideologically polarized Congress and political parties. The outcome was that throughout 2013 and 2014, little legislation was passed. In 2013, a group of conservative Senate Republicans were able to prevent any agreement on the budget and funding of the government, resulting in the stoppage of all but essential federal functions. The public outcry, however, soon forced Republicans to reverse their position and pass a temporary funding bill, but basic differences over public policies and the budget remained unresolved. By 2013, debates about foreign policy also became increasingly partisan as Republicans criticized Obama's leadership and ability to conduct effective policies, especially in response to the Russian actions in the Ukraine and Syria, and to the rise of the Islamic State. With Obama's popularity shrinking, in the 2014 congressional elections, Republicans gained control of Congress, strengthening the political deadlock and ideological differences between the two parties. Although a compromise spending bill was passed in December, there was little incentive for either party to promote bipartisanship as the 2016 presidential campaign began. The first of 17 Republican candidates announced his candidacy in March 2015, and over the next 15 months of hard-fought and frequently caustic primaries, Donald J. Trump gained the nomination. On the Democratic ticket, Hillary Clinton overcame a strong challenge from one-time independent Bernie Sanders in a series of more civil primaries. In the 2016 presidential election, Clinton adopted most of the domestic and foreign policies of Obama, seeking to be the first Democratic candidate to repeat after a two-term Democratic incumbent since Trump, uh, Truman. Blah. Since Truman, Trump took a much more anti-Obama stance, promising to abolish the Affordable Health Act, build a border wall to prevent illegal immigration from Mexico, and reverse most of Obama's foreign policy. In a campaign that stressed dissatisfaction with the current path the country was taking, Trump promised to, quote, make America great again, of course, hearkening back to Reagan's tagline, let's make America great again. In a better and divisive campaign that focused more on personal qualities than issues, it appeared that Clinton would become the nation's first woman president. However, in an election that contradicted most of the political polls and observers, Trump's emphasis on what rural, white, mostly male voters swept him to victory. Triumphant Republicans, having maintained control of the House and Senate, projected the new administration would quickly and decisively alter Obama's and Democratic policies, creating a new, more conservative approach for the country to follow. That is a heck of an introduction. Jumping into the Clinton years, focusing on the questions, in what ways did President Clinton's centrist agenda and personal behavior shape his presidency? How did the contract with America represent a conservative critique of liberalism and democratic policies? And what actions did Clinton take to expand trade and support global stability? I want to get something done, William Jefferson Clinton told a press conference as he entered office. With that, he dove into an ambitious agenda that included an economic recovery plan, support for gay rights, and development of a national health care system. The opening round. Signing the Family and Medical Leave Act, or FMLA, earlier vetoed by Bush, was one of Clinton's first actions. It allowed workers to take up to 12 months of unpaid leave because of illness or family needs and guaranteed they would be able to return to the same job. While the Medical Leave Act drew widespread support, much of Clinton's agenda met with bipartisan opposition. Citing statistics about the soaring costs of health care and the over 40 million Americans who could not afford any health insurance at all, Clinton made enacting a national health care program a primary goal. In September, he appointed First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton to lead a task force to draft legislation. Many working in health-related industries, Republicans, and even Democrats attacked both the goal and the emerging plan. After a year of heated debate, Clinton admitted defeat and dropped the plan. His efforts to support gay rights by having Congress lift the ban against homosexuals in the military also met bipartisan and public opposition and resulted in a compromise policy of don't ask, don't tell that really pleased no one. Don't ask, don't tell required the military not to ask about soldiers' sexual orientations and expected soldiers to refrain from open homosexual activities. But the movement for gay rights continued and strengthened. During the next decades, many states, counties, and cities, including the District of Columbia, passed anti-discrimination laws and sexual preference laws that protected jobs, provided work-related benefits for partners, and allowed same-sex marriages and adoptions. In 2003, the Supreme Court in Lawrence v. Texas declared that consenting adults had the right to sexual privacy and declared that sodomy laws were unconstitutional. Those were passed in 2003, by the way. In September of 2011, the military discarded the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy and allowed homosexuals to openly serve in the military. 
As the number of AIDS victims climbed and the disease spread to the heterosexual population, the public's awareness and fear of AIDS grew, as did governmental and private support for AIDS education, prevention programs, and research. By 2007, AIDS had claimed more than half a million American lives and had killed over 20 million people worldwide, but significant advances in research were also taking place. Combinations of drugs now appear to slow the advance of disease, and at this time here in April 2023, there are four or five people who have been cured of the disease entirely, which represents a really interesting frontier for AIDS research. Clinton also faced bipartisan opposition to his plans for dealing with the national debt, which had risen ominously under Reagan and the still struggling economy. His solutions angered both Republicans and Democrats. Many Democrats criticized his timing of federal spending, trimming, excuse me, of federal spending and his failure to cut middle class taxes. They also refused to support the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT. Both had been initiated by Bush, but were blocked by Senate Democrats who claimed that they would harm the economy by encouraging U.S. factories to relocate to nations with lower costs and standards. To pass both bills, Clinton had to twist Democratic arms and rely on Republican votes. I want to take a moment and define NAFTA and GATT real fast. NAFTA, or the North American Free Trade Agreement, was an agreement approved by the Senate in 93 that eliminated most tariffs and other trade barriers between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. GATT, or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, was first signed in 1947. It sought to encourage free trade among member states by regulating and reducing tariffs and resolving trade disputes. In 1995, its functions were assumed by the World Trade Organization, or the WTO. Republicans also opposed Clinton's economic stimulus package and his proposed budget, claiming that tax increases would harm the economy. Finally, after weeks of heated debate, the budget passed the House by two votes and was approved in the Senate only when Vice President Al Gore cast the tie-breaking vote. For the first time since World War II, a bill had passed Congress, even though every member of the opposition party had voted against it. Talk about strength and votes right there. The bitter fights over the budget, health care, and gays in the military boosted Republican popularity, and in 1994, led by Newt Gingrich, a Republican from Georgia, Republicans seized the initiative with a political agenda called the Contract with America. The Contract with America called for support for family values, large cuts in federal spending, and a balanced budget by 2002. The public responded by giving the Republicans nine new senators, 52 new representatives, and majorities in both houses of Congress for the first time in 40 years. This new conservative majority was going to change the world, predicted Gingrich, now the Speaker of the House. The comeback. The Republican surge in the 1994 election encouraged congressional Republicans to assume the political offensive with a legislative and economic plan that slashed spending on education, welfare, Medicare, Medicaid, and the environment. You cannot sustain the old welfare state with a balanced budget, Gingrich proclaimed. In response, Clinton emphasized his centrism. He agreed that reducing the deficit and balancing the budget should be priorities, but he argued that the Republican tax cuts were too drastic tax and spending cuts, harmful to most people's lives, and mean-spirited. He complained that those who argued that welfare programs created a class of morally impoverished, welfare-dependent people did not understand the realities of those on welfare or the number of children who were receiving essential aid. The battle lines were clear when, in 1995, Republicans drafted their budget bill with large cuts in welfare programs. Clinton sent it back to Congress, where overconfident Republicans refused to pass a spending measure to keep the government operating unless their budget was accepted. Unmoved, Clinton shut down all non-essential government functions first for six days in November, then for 21 days in December. Because the public blamed Republicans for this budget impasse, they were forced to compromise with the president on the budget and accept most of his spending proposals. So there's a government shutdown. Clinton is refusing to accept all these spending cuts. And Congress, the ones who are trying to pass this, uh, this bill, they're ultimately the ones who are blamed. And so they're the ones who have to sort of cave first and do what Clinton wants. In the following months, Clinton and Congress agreed to raise the minimum wage, increase spending for education, job training, and child care, and to pass welfare reform. In July, Clinton signed the 1996 Welfare Act, or the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, saying that it ended, quote, welfare as we know it. The act gave states more responsibility for running welfare programs, reduced access to food stamps, and required those receiving assistance to have a job, seek employment, or enroll in job training or educational programs. 
In 1996, Republicans selected Kansas Senator Robert Dole to run against Clinton, and they attacked Clinton for his liberal policies, which they contended were out of step with the American people. The problem for Republicans was that a majority of the public thought Clinton was doing a good job and that the economy was improving. Clinton's popularity and Dole's often lackluster campaign resulted in Clinton becoming the first Democratic president to be re-elected since FDR, capturing 379 electoral votes and 49% of the popular vote. I want to say that again. He is the first Democratic president to be re-elected, so to have two terms in a row, get elected twice since FDR. Clinton's second term. In his 1997 State of the Union address, Clinton set a centrist agenda for his second term. He spoke about ending the, quote, bickering and extreme partisanship and finding common ground to balance the budget and put a, quote, end to decades of deficits that have shackled our economy. Over the next years, enough common ground was found to balance the budget and achieve surpluses from 1998 to 2001. But on most issues, the bitter partisanship continued, culminating in an effort to impeach Clinton in 1998. In 1997, Republicans, here it is, folks, you've been waiting for this. In 97, Republicans learned of the president's sexual involvement with White House intern Monica Lewinsky and decided to use the affair to try to remove him from office. Clinton denied the allegations, but an investigation confirmed that the affair had gone on between 1995 and 97. Clinton then admitted to inappropriate relations with Lewinsky and to misleading Congress and the public. His supporters argued that the affair was a private matter and it didn't affect how he ran the government. Republicans disagreed, and they cited two offenses, perjury and obstruction of justice. In December of 1998, the House voted to impeach Clinton, who became the second president to face a trial in the Senate that could remove him from office. The first president, Andrew Johnson, was acquitted in 1968, as covered in Chapter 15. The Republicans had a 55 to 45 majority in the Senate, but in a five-week trial, they failed to find the two-thirds majority needed to remove Clinton from office. By February 19, 1999, the drama of impeachment was over. Clinton had expressed his sorrow for the burden he'd put on in the nation, and the government returned to business. Clinton's popularity remained high, while that of Congress dipped. So despite the fact that Clinton is doing these things, that he admits them, and we know that he did indeed carry on this affair, America doesn't really indict him that much for it. He maintains a high level of popularity despite these moral shortcomings. It also does not help that many Republicans are revealed at this point in time to also be having affairs of their own. Clinton's foreign policy. Clinton's foreign policy on economic and trade issues generally followed the path set by President Bush. He oversaw passage of the NAFTA and GATT agreements and the formation of the World Trade Organization, or WTO, to expand international trade. I want to pause real fast and define the WTO. The WTO is a Geneva-based organization that oversees world trading systems. It was founded in 1995 by 135 countries to replace the 1948 General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades, or GATT. Clinton also worked with the G8 nations to promote global economic stability and growth. Moving beyond Bush's policies, Clinton took a more active diplomatic and military role in seeking to resolve international issues. He actively supported the peace process in Northern Ireland that ended 30 years of sectarian violence. He also brokered an accord that established Palestinian self-rule in some Israeli-occupied areas and a treaty of cooperation between Jordan and Israel. Working with the United Nations, Clinton intervened in Haiti to encourage the military junta that ousted democratically elected President Jean-Bertrand Aristide to restore democracy, and in October of 94, Aristide returned to Haiti. To restore peace and stability in the Balkans, Clinton dispatched American forces to join with the UN in protecting safe areas for refugees displaced by the fighting. In the fall of 1995, the U.S. Uh, sponsored peace talks resulting in the Dayton Agreement, which ended the fighting and partitioned the country into a Bosnian-Croat federation and a Serb republic. Stability in the Balkans was tested again in 1998 when Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic tried to crush insurgent forces in the province of Kosovo and began a program of ethnic cleansing aimed at the majority Muslim population. Unable to halt the bloodshed with diplomacy, NATO leaders and U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright called for humanitarian intervention and autonomy for Kosovo within Serbia. Unwilling to use ground forces, U.S. and NATO planes unleashed a bombing campaign in March of 1999. After the Serbian capital of Belgrade was bombed in June, Milosevic agreed to withdraw his troops, recognize Kosovo's autonomy, and allow UN peacekeeping forces into the area to ensure the peace. When the war was over, Milosevic was charged with crimes against humanity by the International War Crimes Tribunal at The Hague, and in 2001 he stood trial for his war crimes, but he died in prison before the trial was completed. 
economy and society, focusing on the questions, what changes were taking place in the American economy as the country headed toward the 21st century, and how did economic changes shape society and politics? Clinton's elections in 1992 and 96 rested in part on the economy, which after the recession of 1990 rebounded into a period of economic growth. Clinton and Democrats gave their policies credit for the economic surge, the balanced budget, and renewed economic and social opportunities for all Americans. As Clinton famously says, it's the economy, stupid. He's popular in the 90s because people have money, people have jobs, people are going back to work, the economy's doing great, he's balancing the budget. If the economy is going right, man, that's a, a quick, you know, one-way ticket toward re-election. While there is some truth in all of Clinton's claims about his policies working in these ways, the economy, or excuse me, the economic surge that occurred throughout the 90s and into the 21st century was also a product of a changing national and global economy, a revitalized economy. The economy that climbed out of the recession in 1992 started one of the longest periods of sustained economic growth in the nation's history. Until it slowed in 2001, it averaged a growth rate of about 3% per year. The revitalized, quote, new economy benefited from increased productivity by American workers after the downsizing, restructuring, and continuing automation of industries during the previous two decades. Globalization and expanding markets for foreign trade also contributed. But the most important reason was the rapid growth in information technology industries and the service sector. The broad-based service industry, which in the 1990s included everyone from highly paid professionals to minimum age workers in retail, expanded from about 50% to over 75% of the workforce. At the same time, new technology and computer industries boomed, pushing stock market prices upward, especially those listed on the NASDAQ index. Suddenly, the ranks of the very rich included dot-com millionaires, men and women who owned or invested in companies associated with the new technology and communications industries, such as Microsoft and internet-based businesses. Northern California's Silicon Valley drew in entrepreneurs like Evan Williams and Apple's Steve Jobs and emerged as a center of the computer and microprocessing industries. Cell phone technology provided ever-increasing mobile communications and connectivity to the internet, changing how the world exchanged and accessed information and services. Merging the new technology with retail, Amazon was created in 1995 and soon was followed by a multitude of other services doing business over the internet. Venture capitalists provided funding for many new internet businesses, connecting the financial system to the vein of gold and technological boom seemed to be. In 2000, the dot-com bubble burst, contributing to a short recession in 2001, but it was only a brief setback. Worldwide, electronics and tech industries continued to produce new products and furthered global economic growth. With each passing year, computers and electronic and communications devices grew smaller, faster, more powerful, and less expensive. The outcome was a revolution that affected everything from politics and military and espionage activities to social chit-chat, information sharing, and online education to the way we do our jobs and live our daily lives. Words like flat screens, googling apps, Facebook, tweeting, selfies, and emojis have become universally used vocabulary. Rich, poor, and in between. The economic boom also meant more jobs. The number of new jobs rose by 12 million and unemployment dropped to 4%, the lowest level since the 1960s. It's worth noting though that some of those jobs are low wage jobs or they're also part-time. That unemployment dropping to 4% is a great overall statistic, but it also obscures that many of those jobs that are created, they're not necessarily you know, enough to support a family. Wages increased by about 4% with low-income workers' incomes growing by 6% between 1993 and 1998. Hispanic and African-American household incomes rose, and the number of Americans living in poverty in 2000 fell to 11.3%, the lowest rate since 1979. Hidden within the statistics, however, were grim realities. As the economy developed, the continued loss of manufacturing jobs moved many people into service industries where wages were lower and benefits were scarce, and the income, back, income gap between the rich and everyone else continued to widen. For more than 15% of Americans who lived below the official poverty level of $15,150, which was for a family of four in 1995, good-paying jobs seemed harder to find. Many middle and working class families' incomes were barely holding steady as medical and fuel costs continued to rise. As the baby boom generation grew older, health care costs also climbed. In 1990, Americans spent $714 billion on healthcare, only to watch costs rise to over $2 trillion in 2007 and mushroom to $3 trillion by 2014, an average of $9,523 per person. Women, family, and the culture war. Many also worried about the growing feminization of poverty as the number of single women heading households and of children living in poverty increased. 
A contributing factor was that too often women experienced inequalities in positions and pay. In California, a female manager discovered that her pay was less than half of the male assistant managers. When she confronted the company, she was told that the assistant manager had a wife and two children. She pointed out that she was a single mother with a child to support. Beset by such inequalities, she and other women brought class action lawsuits against a variety of companies, including the public's chain of supermarkets and against Walmart. The feminization of poverty was only one trend among women throughout the 1990s and into the 21st century. More women were entering college than men and continuing on to professional and graduate programs. More than three-fourths of women worked outside the home and they made up about one-half of the workforce. By the end of the 1990s, women also made up about one-fourth of all doctors and lawyers and they held nearly 30% of managerial and executive positions. Despite such gains, most women still only earned 73 cents for every dollar a man made, and many encountered a, quote, glass ceiling that kept them out of the highest positions. The glass ceiling, by the way, is defined as an intangible barrier within the hierarchy of a company that prevents women or minorities from rising to upper-level positions. Some turned to the courts, contesting job discrimination and sexual harassment, which women complained were pervasive throughout workforces. Supporting an expanded view of sexual harassment, in 1993, the Supreme Court in Harris v. Forklift Systems ruled that sexual harassment involved not only verbal and physical conduct, but also the creation of a hostile environment. A changing and more diverse society and women's expanding roles further fueled the cultural wars. In the debate over women's rights and the future of the family, conservatives and groups like the Eagle Forum and Concerned Women of America claim that liberalism and feminism endangered the traditional fam American family. They argued, too, that even mommy-friendly workplaces were not a replacement for full-time mothers. It all comes down to values, an anti-feminist explained. Traditional values work because they are the guidelines most consistent with human nature. Among those protecting traditional values were groups opposing abortion and gay rights. In 1992, conservatives cheered a small victory when the Supreme Court in Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania v. Casey ruled that in some cases, states could modify the right to an abortion. At the same time, some within the Right to Life movement opted for intimidation and violence and targeted abortion clinic doctors, staff, and patients. By 1994, more than half of all abortion clinics reported varied cases of one or both, and nearly 100 clinics had been targets of arson or bombings. In response, in 1994, the Clinton administration supported the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, which restricted the tactics of intimidation that pro-life supporters could use. Supporting the traditional view of marriage, conservatives championed the passage of the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act following a Hawaiian state court decision that determined that laws barring same-sex marriages were unconstitutional in that state. The Defense of Marriage Act barred federal recognition of same-sex marriages and allowed states to ignore such marriages performed in other states. The judicial arena. By the end of the Bush administration in 1992, many Republicans were praising the more conservative approach being taken by the federal court system and Chief Justice William Rehnquist, who thought that the Warren and Burger courts had erred by, quote, reflecting society's changing and expanding values and had incorrectly acted as a legislative body. Believing that Congress and the state legislators, slaters, not the court, should determine policies, Chief Justice Rehnquist supported reducing federal authority and returning executive and legislative power to the states, federalism. Conservatives applauded the 1992 DeKalb County, Georgia decision that ruled busing could not be used to integrate schools segregated by de facto housing patterns, as well as a ruling upholding the use of a state voucher system to provide public funding for religious schools in Zelman v. Simon Hart, 2002. In 2005, following the resignation of Justice O'Connor and the death of Justice Rehnquist, President George Walker Bush strengthened the conservative element in the court by appointing Samuel Alito and naming John Roberts the new Chief Justice. As with the Rehnquist court, conservatives generally approved the court's decisions. They praised the court for its decisions weakening affirmative action and increasing the state's abilities to resist implementing executive and congressional directives, and for its support for an individual's right to own and carry a firearm, like with District of Columbia v. Heller, 2008, its removal of restrictions on campaign contributions from corporations and groups in the Citizens United case from 2010, and its nullification of part of the Voting Rights Act in the Shelby County, Alabama case in 2013. Conservatives were less pleased with the court's 2012 decision upholding the administration's health care program, and they loudly denounced the court's 2013 decision that declared the Defense of Marriage Act was unconstitutional. That case, by the way, was U.S. v. Windsor.
The unexpected uh, death of the leading conservative justice uh, Antonin Scalia in February of 2016 and the unwillingness of the Senate to consider the nomination of a new justice until after the November presidential election left the court evenly balanced between conservative and liberal justices. I want to make a really quick note too. Again, I'm recording this here in April of 2023. In 2015, with the decision of Burgefell v. Hodges, the Supreme Court had invoked the 14th Amendment to legalize same-sex marriage everywhere. And as it stands now in 2023, same-sex marriage uh, marriages can take place really anywhere and same-sex couples can receive federal benefits just like heterosexual couples can. Also in 2022, with Dobbs v. Jackson, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, saying that the Constitution does not protect a woman's right to an abortion. Moving on now to new agendas and challenges, including the questions, what issues contributed to Bush's election and why was the election so controversial? And how did Bush's domestic and foreign policy agendas differ from those of the Clinton years? Americans welcomed the 21st century with celebrations and optimism. With the economy expanding, it was an upbeat and popular President Clinton who told the American people, quote, we have restored the vital center, replacing outdated ideologies with a new vision anchored in basic enduring values, opportunity for all, responsibility from all, and a community for all Americans. He had set forth an agenda that included improving Social Security, health care, and the quality of education. It was an agenda that Vice President Al Gore, as the Democratic candidate for the presidency in 2000, could embrace. Republicans labeled the agenda typically liberal and focused on the dangers of big government and the need to cut taxes and restore integrity to the White House. The 2000 Election Leading the Republican hopefuls was George W. Bush, governor of Texas and son of the former President H.W. Bush, who had been elected in 88. Remember that H.W. was Reagan's vice president. Bush won the nomination and announced a policy of compassionate conservatism, which stressed the use of private sector initiatives to improve education, social security, and health care. At the heart of this campaign, however, was a promise to reduce taxes. Maybe he's going to do what his dad said, read my lips, no new taxes. We'll see if that pans out. The campaign generated a lot of spending and little excitement or sharp debates. On the issues, the candidates' differences were largely matters of how-to, reflecting party ideologies. To improve education, Bush supported state initiatives and more stringent testing, whereas Al Gore wanted federal funds to hire more teachers and repair school facilities. On how to spend the budget surplus, Bush advocated a tax cut to give money back to the people. Gore said he would use the surplus to reduce the national debt and fund government programs. The two candidates ran in a dead heat. Bush was strong in the less populated states and was particularly popular with white males who voted for him 5-3. to three. Gore's strength was in urban areas. He received over 70% of the vote in large metropolitan areas in the Northeast and Pacific Coast and among Latinos and African Americans. On election day, Gore received a minuscule majority of popular votes, half a million more than Bush out of the 10.5 million votes cast, but Bush appeared to have won the Electoral College with 271 votes to 267, which is one vote more than is necessary to win. But when Americans awoke the next day, they found that the election was not yet settled. There was a question over Florida's 25 electoral votes. Bush carried Florida by less than 1,000 popular votes, and Florida law thus required a recount. This is why it's important to vote, folks. Florida, literally a thousand people are deciding where these 25 votes will go. That's how small the margin is. As the recount proceeded in the state of Florida, Gore's supporters claimed voting irregularities and asked the Florida Supreme Court to set aside certification of the vote until hand counts were completed in several largely Democratic counties. When the court agreed, Bush supporters filed their own suit in federal court. Ultimately, on December 4th, a special session of the U.S. Supreme Court decided in a 5-4 decision that the outcome favoring Bush should be certified. Bush had won Florida's electoral votes and the presidential election. Gore conceded, and an hour later, President-elect Bush stated, Whether you voted for me or not, I will do my best to serve your interests and I will work to earn your respect. I want to read now, uh, Toward a More Perfect Union, the excerpt on page 805, Federalism and the Supreme Court. Since 1995, the Rehnquist and Roberts courts have used the 10th and 11th Amendments to limit federal authority over the states, reversing over 35 years of legal precedent. In reinforcing the concept of federalism, the court has taken the position that states hold joint sovereignty with the federal government and that in some areas their sovereignty is immune to federal controls. In a series of decisions, for example, U.S. v. Lopez 95, Prince v. U.S. 97, Alden v. Maine in 99, and U.S. v. Morris in 2000, the court ruled that states and their institutions did not have to abide by specific federal laws and mandates. In explaining the court's position, Chief Justice Rehnquist declared a distinction between what is truly national and truly local. 
Within this context, for example, when the court ruled in the Kimmel case 99 that Florida did not have to comply with federal age discrimination rules for its employees, Justice O'Connor said the federal goal of eliminating age discrimination must yield to state sovereignty. Justice Thomas simply declared that the 11th Amendment precluded federal courts from hearing lawsuits against a state unless the state consented. Moving on now, the Bush agenda. Despite the controversial election, George Walker Bush entered the presidency determined to implement his campaign promises. He had a Republican majority in the House of Representatives and a 50-50 tie in the Senate, which, if necessary, could be broken by the vote of the vice president. Among Bush's highest priorities were tax cuts and education reform. Bush's tax cut, $1.6 trillion over a six-year period, had two objectives, to stimulate the economy and to force a reduction in government spending. Many Democrats rejected the projected tax cut, arguing that it was too big in favor of the rich, while the largest reductions given were, were given to the top two income brackets, kind of like, you know, maybe what Reagan did. Others found it difficult to oppose a tax cut, and in June, Congress voted to cut taxes for the second time since World War II. Bush praised the vote as expanding, quote, individual freedom. Bush also moved to reduce federal regulations and standards for many industries and businesses, especially those in the energy sector, and he pushed forward his education bill. Passed in June 2001, the No Child Left Behind Act required states to set proficiency standards in math and reading and financially penalized schools whose students did not meet the standards. I myself am a product of NCLB, we'll talk more about that in class, charting new foreign policies. During the presidential campaign, Bush had called for a more humble foreign policy that focused on national needs. As president, he appointed a recognized advocate of international cooperation, General Colin Powell, as Secretary of State, but he relied more on National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and Vice President Dick Cheney, all of whom favored a more unilateral approach. Bush quickly reversed Clinton's policies on supporting measures to fight global warming and create international controls on biological and chemical weapons. He also broke off discussions with the Russians on a nuclear non-proliferation agreement and considered re-energizing Reagan's anti-ballistic missile defense system. Many, including the Russians, feared that Bush could start a new arms, way th arms race with Russia and China. European newspapers denounced the American go-it-alone policy, calling the president the toxin toxic Texan, a an assault against a nation. However, an event that no one thought possible would characterize Bush's foreign policy and alter his presidency. On the morning of September 11, 2001, a group of five terrorists led by Mohammed Atta hijacked four airplanes that became flying bombs aimed at symbols of American financial and military power. At 8.48 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. As New York Fire and Police Departments responded, a second airliner struck the South Tower of the World Trade Center at 9.06 a.m. The second crash confirmed that the U.S. was being attacked by terrorists. The scope of the attack expanded when a third hijacked plane slammed into the Pentagon just outside Washington, D.C. at 9.45 a.m. A fourth plane crashed into a field southeast of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania after passengers, learning about the other hijackings by cell phone, had battled the terrorists, causing the plane to go down short of its Washington, D.C. target. In New York City, the tragedy was soon magnified when the twin towers of the World Trade Center, the tallest structures in the city, collapsed, engulfing and killing thousands, including many of the firefighters and police officers who had rushed into the towers to provide help. Over 3,000 people died that morning. President Bush, speaking to a stunned nation, declared that Americans had witnessed evil, the very worst of human nature, and he vowed to track down those responsible and bring them to justice. This is the worst attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor, which, as you remember, propelled us into World War II. War and Politics. Considering the questions, how did the events of September 11, 2001 affect the public and change Bush's foreign policy? What considerations and events led to the U.S.'s invasion of Iraq? And how did the war in Iraq shape the issues Republicans wanted to highlight in the presidential election of 2004? Patriotism and support for the president swept across the country after September 11th, but there was also a feeling of vulnerability. Sales of guns and gas masks increased. Assaults and threats targeted Arab Americans and those who looked Middle Eastern. In Congress, battles over domestic issues were set aside. The war we have now is against terrorism, said Democrat John Burrow of Louisiana, and Congress quickly appropriated $40 billion for disaster relief and support for the effort to fight against terrorism. Lawmakers passed the USA Patriot Act in October, giving law enforcement agencies wider discretion in dealing with those suspected of terrorism. To define the Patriot Act real fast, which actually stands for Uniting and Strengthening America by Providing Appropriate Tools Required to Intercept and Obstruct Terrorism, 
This is legislation passed by Congress in 2001 that reduced constraints on the Justice Department and other law enforcement agencies in dealing with individuals having suspected links to terrorism. The Patriot Act loosened restrictions on the use of searches, wiretaps, and monitoring of the internet. Further, it gave the Attorney General's office the power to detain and to deport non-citizens thought to be a security risk. risk. While some criticized the Patriot Act for restricting civil liberties, most Americans supported actions that might prevent further acts of terrorism, including the Justice Department's detention of over 1,200 people, mostly Arab immigrants. To defend against terrorism at home, in November, Congress agreed to form a new cabinet department, Homeland Security, whose function would be to coordinate and direct various governmental agencies in preventing further acts of terrorism against the U.S. The president also asked Congress for large increases in spending for the military and for homeland defense. Bush accepted that the spending would create a deficit, maintaining that the price of freedom was never too high. The War on Terrorism While Americans grappled with the enormity of the terrorist attacks, the Bush administration named Al-Qaeda, a world, uh, worldwide Islamic militant organization led by Osama bin Laden, as the organization responsible for the 9-11 attacks. The son of a wealthy Saudi Arabian family, bin Laden had dedicated himself to freeing Muslim nations from outside control, especially American capitalist control. He announced in 1996 that it was the duty of every Muslim to kill Americans and their allies. He and al-Qaeda were responsible for a series of strikes against American targets, including attacks on American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998, and a car bombing in front of the World Trade Center that killed six people. Responding to the car bombing, President Clinton had ordered missile strikes against al-Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan, but they did not deter further terrorism. Seventeen sailors died on board the USS Cole when, in October 2000, al-Qaeda-linked terrorists struck the American warship in Yemen. President Bush quickly defined the new war on terrorism as a global effort, aimed not only against the network of terrorists, but at any person or country who supported them. Every nation and every region, he announced, had a choice to be with us or you are with the terrorists. Inside the White House, plans were being made for a military response against the Taliban, the Islamic fundamentalist government of Afghanistan, which supported bin Laden's operations. At the same time, the administration constructed a global coalition to fight terrorism. On October 7, 2001, the U.S. and others in the coalition began the Afghan company campaign to destroy al-Qaeda and to remove the Taliban from power. In early November, American Special Forces units working with a collection of existing anti-Taliban forces, the Afghan Northern Alliance, captured the city of Kabul. The Taliban no longer ruled Afghanistan. Within weeks, the coalition formed an interim government headed by Hamid Karzai. Suffering heavy losses, al-Qaeda and bin Laden fled into the mountains bordering Pakistan and Afghanistan, where they continued to conduct their efforts. With the threat from bin Laden reduced, the Bush administration shifted its focus to Iraq. In January 2002, Bush described an axis of evil composed of Iraq, Iran, and North Korea that threatened world security. Kind of sounds like the evil empire speech, perhaps, to make a comparison to Reagan. He also announced a new strategy against terrorists and others who threatened world peace, the preemptive strike. The Bush Doctrine, Rumsfeld explained, rejected Clinton's reflexive policy. In the war against terrorism, the nation could not wait until it was attacked, but it would take whatever action was necessary to prevent such attacks. I want to take a real quick uh, moment and define preemptive strike again. This is a policy adopted by the Bush administration, part of the Bush Doctrine, allowing the U.S. to use force against suspected threats before the threat occurs. The first preemptive strike was against Iraq. The reasons were varied. In part, it was personal. Saddam Hussein represented unfinished business left over from the war to liberate Kuwait. Remember Operation Desert Storm with H.W. Bush? Saddam Hussein was also a vile dictator who, the administration said, possessed chemical and biological weapons, classified, uh, classified as weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs, and supported al-Qaeda and terrorism. The administration designated his regime as a threat to American security and world peace that needed to be removed from power. Others, especially in the international community, discounted Iraq's immediate threat and resisted the use of force. They recommended diplomacy and economic sanctions to force Saddam Hussein's regime to allow UN inspectors to verify whether it had or was building WMDs. When, over the next months, diplomacy and inspections proved frustrating and inconclusive, the Bush administration intensified its efforts to obtain UN support for using force. The administration claimed that it had proof that Saddam Hussein had WMDs and it was reviving his nuclear weapons program. When pressed on Iraq's nuclear capability, Condoleezza Rice admitted that the status of Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons was unknown, but she added, we don't want the smoking gun to become a mushroom cloud. Not waiting for the UN, in October, Congress passed a resolution permitting a preemptive strike against Iraq. In November, the UN issued a less forceful resolution ordering Iraq to give up its WMDs or to face, quote, serious consequences. 
I want to take a moment now and skip up to read It Matters Today, Islamic Fundamentalism. When the Shah of Iran was overthrown, most Americans were introduced to Islamic fundamentalism for the first time. Remember that happens under Carter? It appeared to many Americans that Islamic fundamentalism was anti-American, anti-democratic, and militant, advocating violence, even the use of terrorism, to accomplish its goals. Since 1979, that belief has been hardened by terrorist attacks against the U.S., including those against the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. The rise of al-Qaeda and ISIS has added to the perception that Islamic fundamentalism is linked to jihadism and that fundamentalist objective is nothing less than the total destruction of the West, and there can be no peaceful coexistence. Others respond that the ex extremists within the Islamic fundamentalist movement are a small minority and that most Muslims are neither anti-democratic nor anti-Western. However, extensive fundamentalism is, it has clearly become a powerful force in international and American politics. More Americans than ever before now have negative views toward Islam and believe that it promotes violence more than any other religions. Are these views based on their perceptions of terrorism, of fundamentalism, or of Islam? With Islam the fastest growing religion in the U.S., should schools and institutions recognize Muslim religious holidays and dress codes? And because of the dangers of terrorism, should the government take special precautions in allowing Muslims to travel or immigrate to the United States? Those are all very hot-button current political questions. Iraq and politics. On March 17, 2003, as American troop strength in the Persian Gulf region grew, Bush was tired of playing patty cake with the UN and Iraq. He gave Saddam Hussein notice to leave the country within 48 hours or to face a military onslaught that would shock and awe those who witnessed it. That quote, shock and awe, is going to come back. When Saddam showed no sign of leaving on March 19th, before the ultimatum expired, American and British forces launched an offensive to capture Baghdad. It met only moderate resistance, and on April 9th, Baghdad was in American hands, and Saddam and his government were in hiding. On May 1st, Bush announced the combat operations in Iraq were over and it proclaimed mission accomplished. Shock and awe had apparently worked. The president's approval rating soared. Removing Saddam Hussein proved simple, but it was soon apparent that remaking Iraq would be no easy task. Most Iraqis thank the U.S. for removing Saddam, who was later found hiding in a small spider hole in the ground in December 2003 and taken into custody. But the Iraqis quickly grew impatient with the U.S. occupation. They complained about the slow restoration of electricity, water, and other necessities, and they criticized the ominous lack of internal security. Impatience turned into anger as bitter divisions within the Iraqi population erupted into violence and rebellion. Iraq became a new kind of war zone as occupation forces faced rapidly expanding violence, not only from those resisting the occupation and the U.S.-sponsored interim government, but also from those fighting a sectarian civil war between Sunni and Shiite religious factions. Over the next two years, terrorism and violence rose dramatically, resulting in thousands of American and tens of thousands of Iraqi casualties. The administration admitted that what it had projected as a short-term American occupation was going to be much longer and much more expensive. This is not his daddy's desert storm. Nonetheless, Bush often explained it was necessary to stay the course and refashion Iraq into a stable democratic state, which would promote peace and stability in the Middle East. The reality was quite different as anti-American sentiment across much of the Arab world increased. At home and abroad, support for Bush's Iraq policies ebbed as American casualties increased and the Bush administration admitted it could find no weapons of mass destruction. Over the next two years, various investigatory commissions established uh, to evaluate the intelligence reports and decisions leading to the war determined that the information claiming that Saddam had WMDs and information saying that he had links to al-Qaeda was actually wrong. With critics blaming the administration for manipulating the nation into military action, the U.S. seemed trapped in an expensive war with no plans to end the conflict or withdraw American troops. Amid growing questions about the Iraq War, Bush ran for re-election. Although he received positive public approval ratings for combating terrorism, the public gave him lower marks on conducting the Iraq War, dealing with the economy, and controlling the deficit. Accordingly, the Democratic presidential candidate, Senator John Kerry of Massachusetts, focused on the economy and the war. Bush attacked Kerry and the Democrats as too liberal and claimed that their opposition to the war sorry about that, claimed that their opposition to the war undermined the American effort and encouraged terrorism. When critics pointed to this misinformation on WMDs used to justify the invasion, Bush stressed the need to end Saddam Hussein's brutal dictatorship and his decisive leadership. We acted, we led, stated Bush. Bush argued, too, that the economy was improving, spurred by the administration's low interest rates, tax cuts, and military spending. Democrats replied that the administration's declared victory over the recession was premature, as many were still losing their jobs and seeing their wages drop. 
Republicans also attacked Democrats over a variety of social issues, including gay marriage. In November 2003, the Massachusetts Supreme Court had ruled that banning same-sex marriage violated the state's constitution. The court gave the state legislature 180 days to act on its decision. The following April, the Massachusetts legislature approved a constitutional amendment that permitted same-sex civil unions but defined marriage as a union only between a man and a woman. The amendment, however, could not be ratified until 2006, which meant that until it was ratified, Massachusetts would issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Across the country, the response to the Massachusetts court's decision was generally negative, and 35 states hurried to strengthen their prohibition of same-sex marriage. In addition, many opponents of same-sex marriage believe that civil unions should also be banned. In February 2004, President Bush endorsed the idea of a constitutional amendment that would disallow same-sex marriage. When pressed for his view, Kerry opposed such an amendment and argued that the issue would be left to states to legislate. He also said that he personally opposed same-sex marriages but approved of civil unions. Targeting, quote, battleground swing states, both parties poured vast amounts of time and campaign money into a few states, along with venomous campaign ads. Both also took new approaches to campaigning using the internet to woo supporters. Bloggers created their own websites providing news, political analysis, and ads for and against the candidates. Days before the election, most polls show the candidates tied in popular support. On November 2, uh, 2nd, 2004, more Americans voted than ever before. They re-elected Bush, giving him 51% of the vote. Bush had effectively mobilized his party's loyalists and won most of the battleground states. To the surprise of most observers, however, a majority of Bush supporters stated the moral issues and family values were critical re reasons for how they voted. Supporting this observation in Ohio, which was critical to the president's re-election and 10 other states, voters affirmed their support for amendments to their state constitutions to prohibit same-sex marriages and civil unions. Make no mistake, conservative Christian and value voters won this election, stated one conservative observer. Bush's second term. Referring to his victory as a public mandate for action and with Republican majorities in Congress, President Bush was eager to use his political capital to implement domestic goals that promoted an ownership society, putting control in the hands of individuals. Now comes the revolution, voiced some conservatives when the president announced that strengthening family values and reforming social security, tax codes, and education were agenda priorities. In foreign affairs, Bush said the election showed support for creating a democratic Iraq and his war against terrorism. But Bush's political capital fell apart within months when Congress and the public rejected his efforts to privatize Social Security and to further reduce taxes. His leadership, which he had touted during the election campaign, suffered a serious blow following his lethargic response to the devastation caused by a Category 4 hurricane. On August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina, devastate, Katrina excuse me, devastated areas of the Gulf Coast and battered New Orleans, much of which is below sea level. When the levees protecting the city broke, floodwaters poured in and submerged some sectors of New Orleans under 20 feet of water. When television crews broadcast the horrific conditions and widespread destruction, especially in New Orleans, it became clear that government agencies were, at best, slow to deal with the crisis. To many, it appeared that both President Bush and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, were, ignore, were ignoring the stricken city and downplaying the magnitude of the disaster. The administration's slow response caused significant damage to its aura of efficient management and was a blow to the public's confidence in Bush's leadership and his policies. The rich escaped, conservative writer David Brooks editorialized, while the poor were abandoned. Leaving the poor in New Orleans was the moral equivalent of leaving the injured on the battlefield. Katrina pushed Bush's popularity rating below 50% and criticism of the administration's domestic and war policies intensified. The Iraq War was not going well. The civil war between religious factions continued and the death tolls for both Americans and Iraqis soared. Over 3,000 American soldiers had died since the occupation started. For Iraqis, exact numbers are unknown, but estimates range from over a half million to less than 100,000. At home, gasoline prices and the national debt continued to rise, and Bush's popularity continued to fall as the 2006 congressional elections neared. With all 435 House seats and 33 Senate seats up for grabs, Democrats, sensing an opportunity to regain control of Congress, called for a new direction for America. The results were better than Democrats had hoped. In a rout, Democrats won 31 additional seats in the House and gained six seats in the Senate, gaining a majority in both bodies. In the House, triumphant Democrats selected Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi from California as the first woman to hold that position. It was, as she said, a historic moment, one that broke the marble ceiling and one that women had been waiting for for more than 200 years. Some thought the election results ended the Reagan revolution and that the Bush administration would have to moderate its policies, especially on Iraq. 
Bush admitted that he and Republicans had taken a thumping, but he showed little willingness to change his agenda. Denying that the election was a call to change his policy toward Iraq, Bush announced a uh, 21,500 troop surge to boost security, reduce the violence, and allow the Iraqi forces to complete the training that they were receiving from U.S. troops. It was the way to win the war, according to the administration, and Vice President Cheney stressed that efforts to block the president's plan would undermine the troops. Most Democrats opposed the surge and called for a time frame for the removal of American forces. Republicans rejected any timeline and argued that the surge was working, reducing violence and stabilizing the Iraqi government. Economic Crises and Obama With the battle lines drawn over the war in Iraq, the 2008 presidential campaign started a year and a half before the election. The leading Democratic candidates, Senators Hillary Clinton of New York and Barack Obama of Illinois, were breaking historical traditions of gender and race since neither a woman nor an African American had ever been nominated for the presidency by a major party. After a series of hard-fought primaries, Obama secured the nomination and selected Senator Joseph Biden of Delaware as his running mate. In a less bruising series of primaries, Arizona Senator John McCain overcame his Republican challengers and captured the nomination. Hoping to consolidate his, uh, his support from conservative Republicans and to attract women voters, McCain surprised everyone by naming Alaska Governor Sarah Palin as his running mate. Many expected the war in Iraq and Obama's lesser political experience to dominate the campaign issues. The campaign began nearly as expected. McCain touted his decades of government service and attacked Obama as inexperienced, too liberal, weak on foreign policy, and wrong in his position on the Iraq War. Obama countered by offering innovation and change, asking the nation if they wanted four more years of the same failed Bush policies. Obama argued that Bush had fought the wrong war and should instead have continued the effort in Afghanistan to destroy al-Qaeda. Afghanistan, Obama asserted, should be the priority to hunt down terrorists, bring bin Laden to justice, and establish a stable country. But the central issue of the election campaign soon shifted away from comparative experience and the war on terror to who could best deal with a growing economic crisis. A mid-June Gallup poll discovered more than 56% of voters thought fixing the economy was more important than fighting terrorism and believed that Obama was more qualified on economic issues than McCain. Signs of an unsteady economy were visible for those choosing to see them as early as 2006. At the center of the brewing economic storm were extremely low interest rates, a boom in the housing market, inattentive government regulators, and greed. Banks and other lending institutions made housing loans, including subprime loans, to thousands of people who could normally not afford them. Subprime loans, by the way, are loans that carry a higher than normal interest rate, and they're generally used to make a loan to somebody with a history of bad credit and default. Between 2005 and 6, such loans represented 20% of all housing loans. In many cases, profit-seeking lenders actively marketed subprime and other special loan arrangements to high-risk borrowers. In one case, a worker at McDonald's who earned $35,000 a year was able to get a half-million-dollar loan for a home. Are you kidding me? What? Then in 2007, housing values began to drop. Within a short time, an alarming number of homeowners were underwater, owing more than their house was worth. A cascade of foreclosures followed, starting a financial crisis. Institutions that had either directly or indirectly invested in mortgages, once considered a safe investment, found themselves short of capital and unable to pay their investors, depositors, and creditors. By September 2008, the stock market tumbled and banks and insurance and investment corporations teetered on the edge of bankruptcy. Secretary of the Treasury Henry Paulson and Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke convinced the, financial, the fiscally conservative Bush administration that a massive infusion of money was needed to prop up some of the nation's largest financial institutions. They were too big to fail, said one government official. Bush asked Congress for $700 billion for the Troubled Asset Relief, Pro Relief Program, or TARP. The alternative, he said, was to watch this sucker, the economy, go down. Congress approved the complex and controversial bill, and Bush signed it on October 3rd. Responses to the TARP were mixed. Many people complained that it rewarded, bleh, it rewarded Wall Street, those who had caused the economic crisis, and did nothing for Main Street, the hardworking Americans who were losing their jobs or homes or both. Basically, you have people here who made unwise financial decisions, and now the government is bailing them out. It is saving them from ruin, from financial ruin. This has happened before in U.S. history. This is not the first time this has happened, folks. Others voiced concerns about the TARP's effectiveness and cost and about the level of government intervention in buying the assets of private financial institutions. Even more controversial was the Bush administration's request in December for more funds, $17.4 billion in loans to support failing American automobile manufacturers, General Motors, and Chrysler. By November, the economic crisis, now officially a recession, had intensified and spread to Europe and Asia. 
Obama offered change, and on election day, more people voted than in any other presidential election, providing him a decisive victory. Remember, the economy's a huge deal with elections. While the president is limited in what they can do to help or to hurt the economy, you know, if the economy's going good, whoever's in office is generally going to do okay, but if the economy's doing poor, man, oh man, that's a recipe for, you know, disaster in an election. Obama received 53% of the popular vote and 365 electoral votes. Democrats also added eight seats to their majority in the House and 21 to their margin in the House. On January 20th, 2009, President Obama gave his inaugural address to over a million people who braved cold weather to watch the inauguration ceremonies. He acknowledged the serious problems the nation confronted. Our nation is at war against a far-reaching network of violence and hatred. Our economy is badly weakened, a consequence of greed and irresponsibility on the part of some, but also our collective failure to make hard choices and to prepare the nation for a new age. He added that the challenges would not be easily overcome, but that the work of remaking America would be done, and the, he voiced hope that the bitter polarization that had characterized politics would be laid aside for the common good. So he's talking about trying to be bipartisan, right? Kind of like Bush had done too. Obama's presidency. Considering the questions, what major issues contributed to Obama's election in 08, and what constraints did he face in implementing his policies? In what ways were Obama's goals different from the Bush administration's goals, and what events led to the formation of the Tea Party? How did political gridlock shape the debate over domestic and foreign policies? And what major issues contributed to Obama's re-election, and how did politics affect his second term? Over the next months, Obama unfolded an ambitious agenda that emphasized the theme of change voiced during his campaign. He sought to restore the economy, improve education, energy, and environmental policies, implement a national health care system. Remember that the first time we see a national health care system proposed, it's when Theodore Roosevelt is president. This isn't something that Obama's thinking up, you know, all by himself. There have been many other people before him who have voiced support for a measure like that. And he also wants to change the tone and direction of U.S. foreign policy. Despite Democratic majorities in Congress and Obama's popularity, it was not an agenda that reduced political polarization. Republican leaders in the Congress called for solid opposition to Obama's domestic programs and argued that his foreign policy approach would weaken American security and influence. Senator George Voinovich, a Republican from Ohio, summed it up by saying, if Obama was for it, we had to be against it. Shifts in foreign policy during the campaign, Obama had criticized the Bush administration for the war in Iraq and its unilateral approach to most international problems. He and Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton meant to reverse that approach, improve relations with Arab states, and hold international discussions to deal with a wide range of, of global issues, including the global recession, nuclear proliferation, sanctions against Iran and North Korea, and saving the environment. One of the early results was a new Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty start between the United States and Russia, which reduced the number of both countries' nuclear warheads from 6,000 to 1,500. The administration also shifted the focus of the war against terrorism from Iraq to Afghanistan. Fulfilling his campaign pledge, Obama oversaw the final withdrawal of American forces from Iraq by the end of December 2011. The Iraq War had cost more than $800 billion and taken more than 4,000 American lives and 100,000 Iraqi lives. It produced neither a unified nor an economically and politically stable country, but most Americans were just pleased that the war was over. The war in Afghanistan, however, continued as Obama deployed 21,000 additional troops to dismantle and defeat al-Qaeda. The administration hoped that the troop surge would strengthen the Afghan government's effectiveness and control over its country before American troops were withdrawn by the end of 2014. As part of the war against terrorism, Obama increased the use of special forces units and drone attacks against terrorist targets across the Middle East, including in Yemen and Pakistan. In one such mission on May 1, 2011, a Navy SEAL unit covertly entered Pakistan, where they found and killed the elusive Osama bin Laden, generating celebrations across the United States. But the Middle East remained volatile, with continuing concerns about Iran's suspected efforts to build nuclear weapons and new challenges caused by a wave of popular revolts the Arab Spring. The unrest started in Tunisia in December of 2010, when police confiscated street vendor Mohamed Bouzazi's vegetable cart, his only means of making a living. In protest, he set himself on fire. His protest exploded into larger protests against the status quo, authoritarianism, corruption, and political and social conditions that characterized many Middle Eastern governments. In two weeks, the Tunisian regime had crumbled and the movement spread. And remember, Twitter and social media plays a huge role in these protests. Within months, similar protests forced reforms on several governments and toppled others. In Egypt and Yemen, authoritarian rulers were forced out with slight violence, but in Libya and Syria, the governments ordered the military to crush the protesters, and civil war followed. 
Although most Americans cheered the changes taking place, the Obama administration's response was mixed and cautious. In Egypt, the U.S. reluctantly abandoned a longtime ally, authoritarian leader Hosni Mubarak, and rallied behind efforts to establish a democratic government. In Libya, the U.S., along with a coalition of other nations, agreed to support the rebels and use air power to aid in ousting autocrat Muammar Gaddafi. In Syria, where by the end of 2012, the civil war had destroyed much of the country and cost over 40,000 lives, the Obama administration remained cautious, limiting its response to political pressure and trying to remove dictator Bashar al-Assad from power. By the end of his first administration, most Americans gave Obama high marks in the conduct of American foreign policy, but that was not the case when it came to domestic affairs. I'm going to skip up now and read In the Wider World, The Arab Spring, Arab Winter. In December 2010 and the months that followed, popular protests erupted throughout the Arab world. The Arab Spring began in Tunisia but quickly spread across much of the Arab world, reflecting long-standing resentment of undemocratic rule, the brutality of security forces, widespread government and business corruption, and economies that benefited only the top of society. The protesters employed large-scale civil resistance that included demonstrations, marches, rallies, and strikes. To coordinate, organize, and popularize the movement, many effectively used cell phones and social media. The results appeared revolutionary. In some countries, governments were forced to make political, social, and economic reforms, while in others, the governments were toppled, bringing new groups into power. But by 2012, the changes and the hopes brought by the initial revolutions and protests were fading. In Syria, the initial protests quickly spiraled into a brutal civil war and became part of a larger international conflict. But Syria was not the exception. Across the region, authoritarian repression emerged, and religious extremism and ethnic, tribal, and religious conflicts engulfed many countries. An Arab winter then followed the Arab Spring. By 2014, governmental repression, economic crises, and regional and internal civil wars, especially in Syria, had produced a quarter of a million deaths and millions of refugees. Throughout 2014 to 15, millions of people were fleeing Tunisia, Libya, Yemen, Iraq, and Syria, seeking safety and opportunity in Europe. The flood of refugees into Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, and Europe created the largest displacement of people since World War II, as well as a humanitarian crisis. It also heightened fears among European politicians and populations that spurred a flurry of efforts to halt or contain the refugees. The expanding influence of jihadist-inspired terrorists in Europe and the U.S. in 2015 further deepened the Arab winter by stimulating an anti-Muslim backlash and further calls for immigration restrictions and tougher border controls. Change in the politics of filibuster. Obama had emphasized change during his campaign, and in the first weeks of his presidency, prospects for a political honeymoon appeared promising. Congress quickly approved acts supporting equal pay for women, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, and expanding children's health insurance, both previously vetoed by Bush. But the political honeymoon never fully materialized. By February, when the administration introduced a bill to provide over $700 billion in increased federal spending combined with tax relief to stimulate the economy, Republicans balked. They called it an expensive government handout and connected it to the unpopular TARP, which was passed by Bush. Consequently, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act passed in the House without any Republican votes and in the Senate only when three Republican senators broke party unity. It provided money for states to help balance their budgets and pay for infrastructure projects, and it extended unemployment benefits. Despite being the largest economic stimulus bill in American history, it had little effect on what was now being called the Great Recession. I was a freshman in college at KU when the Great Recession started, and it was a really weird time to be away from home for the first time at a university, and just to watch the adults around me sort of freak out and not really understand what was happening, and, you know, the world was pretty uncertain. As Republicans claimed that businesses created jobs, not the government, unemployment rose and the economy and Obama's popularity continued to to decline. In their determination to block further Obama programs, Republicans in the Senate used the filibuster to force Democrats to muster 60 votes to pass legislation. When Obama established his agenda, many recommended that he focus on the economy. But he argued that many issues should not be delayed, especially creating a national health care system. He believed that such a program was necessary to contain the soaring costs of medical care, threatening to bankrupt families, businesses, and the government, and to improve the health of the nation. The Obama administration worked with Congress to craft a program to require that all Americans be covered by health insurance and to establish rules of coverage for insurance companies. It required that most businesses offer health insurance to their employees and that those who were uninsured had to buy health insurance or pay a penalty. After a complex series of debates and compromises over House and Senate versions of the bill, the Senate and the House approved the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the ACA, without Republican support, and Obama signed it into law in March 2010. With its provisions to be implemented over a four-year period, the U.S. had joined most of the world in having a national health care system.
Republicans immediately denounced Obamacare and called for its repeal. At the same time, officials in 18 states filed motions in federal court arguing that the act was unconstitutional and infringed on states' rights. The Constitution, their motion read, nowhere authorizes the U.S. to mandate, either directly or under threat of penalty, that all citizens and legal residents have qualifying health care coverage. President Obama dismissed the constitutional challenges as pure politics and argued that the previous provision, or excuse me, the provisions of national health care took effect, public support for the system would increase. In June 2012, the Supreme Court upheld the act's constitutionality in a 5-4 decision. The court's decision only strengthened Republican resolve to win the 2012 election and repeal it. To read now a deeper understanding of history, evaluating the National Federation of Independent Business v. Sebelius case. Historians, like the rest of the nation, waited for the Supreme Court's decision regarding President Obama's Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. A split decision was expected from a court that was seen as ideologically and politically divided. The court's conservative Republican-appointed justices were expected to oppose parts or all of the law, while the liberal Democratic-appointed justices were expected to uphold it. Although forecasting any of the court's decisions is difficult, most observers projected that a conservative decision would make the president's landmark legislation null and void. They supported their prediction by pointing out that the Supreme Court was moving toward a more conservative view of the federal government's power, reversing the approach of the Warren Court. They also noted that most of the 28 legal challenges to the law took the position that the government had overreached its power in creating a national health system that forced people and states to comply with its dictates, especially the mandate that all citizens have health insurance or face a penalty. They argued against supporters' position that the Commerce Clause could be used to force people to purchase specific products or face a penalty. Others, taking a more political perspective, emphasized that public opinion polls showed that a majority of people disapproved of the law and, in an election year, nearly every Republican was calling for its repeal. On its last day in session, June 28, 2012, the court gave its ruling. As expected, the outcome was a 5-4 to four decision, but to nearly everyone's surprise, the court upheld the constitutionality of the law. Even more surprising was the composition of the majority. As expected, the conservative justices Thomas Scalia, Kennedy and, Kennedy and Alito had rejected the law, holding the mandate as unconstitutional and exceeding the power of the federal government. But the liberal members of the court, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, as predicted, approved it as a necessary function of the government. What was unexpected was that Chief Justice John Roberts, regarded as a conservative, had joined with his liberal colleagues to validate the law. President Obama and the Democrats praised the decision. Disappointed Republicans reaffirmed their opposition to the law and stressed that the decision underlined the importance of electing Mitt Romney as president. In determining the importance of the case, historians will take very different approaches. Some are going to focus on the politics of health care. The court's decision was a historic moment, culminating in an effort reaching back to the progressive era to institute a national health system. Many presidents had called for such a program, and finally Obama had overcome obstacles and succeeded. Others, especially legal historians, are likely to see the importance of the case not in establishing a national system of health care, but in the nature of the decision and what it suggests for the future. Roberts, they could point out, walked a legal tightrope. In his decision, he wrote that the government could enforce the mandate by imposing a tax on those without health insurance, but it did not have the power to order people to buy health insurance. Thus, he validated the long-held liberal goal of a health care system, while shrewdly advancing the conservative vision of the Constitution by limiting the power of the federal government to use the Commerce Clause. In your opinion, which result of this case was more important, the validation of the law and the establishment of a national system of health care, or the precedent that is set by denying using the Commerce Clause to compel citizens to make consumer choices? In July 2010, the administration won another congressional victory when three Republican senators broke ranks and voted for the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, or the Dodd-Frank Act. The act placed new and increased regulations on financial and investment institutions and created a new government agency, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Opponents blasted the act, contending that it could harm the banking system. Obama responded that only those institutions that depended on cutting corners or bilking customers needed to fear it. Republican Resurgence the faltering economy combined with the acidic debates over the economy and healthcare sparked a conservative political insurgency, the Tea Party movement, that swept the country. It began as an anti-tax movement, and maybe that's where they get their name from, remember the Tea Party, you know, from way back in the day. But by the midterm elections of 2010, it became a larger conservative movement. Composed of largely white middle-class Republicans over the age of 40, Tea Partiers saw themselves as victims of a tax structure that stripped them of their hard-earned money to pay for wasteful liberal programs. They focused not only on taxes, but also on the intrusive, un-American nature of big government and on Obama's programs, especially Obamacare. 
Tea Partiers leapt into state and congressional political races, supporting those Republicans who are the most conservative, further polarizing the political debate. The results were stunning. Several moderate Republicans lost congressional seats in primaries to Tea Party candidates, who formed a large portion of the Republican gain of 64 seats in the House of Representatives and six seats in the Senate. The 2010 election results gave Republicans a majority in the House, whereas in the Senate, their 47 votes made their use of the filibuster more effective. The outcome was political gridlock. Conservative Republicans also swept into state offices in large numbers. 17 state governors, along with Republican-dominated legislatures, were elected and began to pass legislation to reduce spending in taxes, curb union activities, promote traditional marriage and gun rights, and restrict women's reproductive rights. Political gridlock. As the new Congress met in 2011, Republicans and Democrats agreed on two basic goals. The economy needed to be fixed and the deficit reduced, but there was little agreement on how to accomplish either. Many of the newly elected Republicans had campaigned on not raising taxes and on reducing the size of the government and the deficit. They vowed to slash government spending, repeal Obamacare, and make permanent the Bush tax cuts that expired at the end of 2012. Obama and most Democrats took an opposite stance. While they agreed that spending needed to be reduced, they wanted fewer budget cuts, opposed changes in Social Security and Medicare, and sought to end the Bush tax cuts for those making more than $200,000 per year. These opposing positions created heated debates and gridlock on economic and budget issues. For months, the two sides, two sides had postured, debated, and grew increasingly exasperated with each other. In June, Obama stated that he was willing to reduce spending to get an agreement to raise the debt ceiling, provided that Republicans agreed to increase tax revenues. House Majority Speaker John Boehner, Republican from Ohio, had replied, the American people will not accept and the House cannot pass a bill that raises taxes on job creators. The deadlock remained until on August 2nd, a last-minute compromise was struck and Congress passed the Budget Control Act. It raised the debt ceiling for six months, cut federal spending without additional revenue from raising taxes, and created a special congressional committee to find agreement on the budget. To force Congress and the White House to reach common ground, the act specified that more than $1 trillion in across-the-board spending cuts would be triggered unless an agreement was reached by the end of December. The threatened cuts, called the sequester, established a, fis a fiscal cliff. It was an imperfect solution that did nothing to resolve the gap between Republicans and Democrats over the budget, tax cuts, and other outstanding issues. As the country entered the 2012 presidential election campaign, politics remained polarized and deadlocked. After heated primaries, Republicans nominated businessman, millionaire, and ex-governor of Massachusetts Willard Mitt Romney as the 2012 presidential candidate. In the campaign, Romney touted his business background and the free market's ability to energize the economy and put people back to work. He promised to cut the size of the government, balance the budget, and to repeal Obamacare. Democrats in turn attacked Romney as a protector of the wealthy with little concern for the middle and working classes and stressed social issues involving gay and women's rights, immigration, and Latino and African American voters. They criticized Romney as part of a Republican plan already at work in Republican-dominated states to reduce spending, especially for social programs, curb union activities, promote traditional marriage and gun rights, restrict women's reproductive rights by denying or limited, limiting abortions and access to reproductive services, and to weaken the right to vote. They pointed out that in several states, Republicans were leading efforts to implement restrictive procedures regarding voter registration, limiting when voting could take place, and requiring those without state-issued IDs, like a driver's license, to obtain special voter identification cards before being allowed to vote. They argued that these efforts would have a negative effect on the elderly, Latino, and African American voters, reducing their ability to vote. By the end of October, in what was the most expensive election campaign in American history, most national polls indicated a small lead for Obama and predicted a close race, with the results hinging on which campaign could turn out the most voters. On election day, it was the Obama forces that mobilized the best, especially in the key swing states of Florida and Ohio. When the votes were counted, President Obama had received over 51% of the popular vote, and his electoral margin doubled that of Romney. Despite Obama's re-election, the division of power in the new 113th Congress remained the same, and few thought the politics of gridlock would change. So Obama wins, but it's not like they're going to be able to get over this political gridlock that they've been locked in where they can't really make deals, where nobody's really willing to compromise. However, before the new Congress convened, the outgoing Congress needed to avoid the fiscal cliff it had established in August. Since then, little had changed. The Special Congressional Committee had been unable to find a bipartisan solution, and Democrats and Republicans remain deadlocked. As the last deadline for funding the government neared, at 2 o'clock a.m. on New Year's Day, the Senate and the White House finally found a compromise and they passed the American Taxpayer Relief Act. It delayed the automatic budget cuts, raised taxes on Americans making more than $400,000 a year, and extended federal unemployment benefits for a year. 21 hours later, the House also agreed. 
The fiscal cliff was temporarily avoided, but it would be the job of the new Congress to try to bridge the deep differences over tax and spending between Democrats and Republicans. Obama's second term. In February, Obama gave his State of the Union address, setting out his policy agenda and expressing the hope that the new Congress would work together with the White House. He was generally pleased with the course of American foreign policy, taking note that American troops had ended their combat role in Iraq and would soon end that role in Afghanistan as well. Speaking to domestic issues, the president listed several priorities, including immigration reform and confronting climate change and gun violence, but he placed an emphasis on finding a solution to issues surrounding the budget. The American people, he said, expect us to put the nation's interests before party, to forge reasonable compromise. The responsibility of improving this union, he added, remains a task of us all. Most observers believe there was little chance that the White House and Congress would find much common ground even on foreign policy matters. The observers were correct. The new Congress proved no more willing to compromise than the previous one. It quickly became clear that no compromise would be found on gun control, immigration reform, or efforts to combat climate change. In the days following the December 14, 2012 massacre of 26 children and teachers at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newton, Connecticut, Newtown, excuse me, Connecticut, by a single gunman armed with an assault rifle, many thought Congress would respond with enhanced gun control legislation. But as the new Congress met, opponents of gun controls were able to prevent any new legislation. Immigration legislation, too, was deadlocked despite both political parties agreeing that the existing system needed reform. Frustrated by the lack of congressional action, in June 2012, the president issued an order that implemented the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, policy that allowed children brought to the U.S. by undocumented immigrants to remain in the country and to pursue a path to citizenship. This measure conflicted sharply with views held by most conservatives who argued for widespread immigration restrictions. In November of 2014, Obama went further and issued, or excuse me, used an executive order called the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents, or DAPA program, that would allow over 4 million undocumented immigrants to stay in the U.S. and to obtain worker permits. His action immediately encountered opposition from conservatives. 26 state governments filed lawsuits to oppose the program, maintaining the president had exceeded his executive powers. In February 2015, a federal appeals court agreed, halting the implementation of the executive order until the case was decided by the Supreme Court. In June 2016, following the death of Justice Scalia, the Supreme Court voted 4-4 to to uphold the federal appeals court decision, preventing nearly half the nation's illegal immigrants from benefiting from DACA and DAPA. The court's decision drew support from conservatives who argued that the president had overstepped his executive powers and highlighted the importance of the immigration issue in the 2016 presidential campaign.